The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Kiki mai, kaki mai, hello and welcome to Gone by Lunchtime, the politics podcast from the multi-award nominated hot take factory, The Spin-Off. My name is Toby Manhire and with me are the executive producer of The Hui, Annabel Lee, and journalist turned political advisor turned PR hack, Ben Thomas. Together, to borrow the phrase of an Australian politician from earlier today, we will be going off like a frog in a sock. Today, John Key and the Panama Papers and non-tax havenness, the state of the Labour Party, Helen Clark's bid to become Secretary General of the UN, and much more, if not indeed much, much more. Annabelle, how are you? How's the hooey going? Two weeks in? You got a bit of a publicity boost thanks to the Sunday Star Times and Māori Television on day one? We did, yes. I think they um, really helped to raise people's awareness of the show, so... Um, although hurtful, it was actually very helpful. There so was a was story to, to explain to people about um, some wardrobe that uh, Mihingaragi Forbes, the presenter of the Hui, and before that Native Affairs that Annabelle also produced. Um, and there was a very puzzlingly timed and specific official information request. And then it all landed on the front page, was it, of the Sunday Star Times on, 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 on day one? I think um, Duncan Grieve um, described it as a steaming turd on the doorstep mm-hmm. of, of the hui. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a welcome mat of sorts, I guess. How you been? I'm, I'm, I'm good. How was your um, campaign to establish yourself as a leading commentator on craft beer? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm already kind of at the pinnacle. I think no, nobody's offering the sort of craft beer insights. You don't like craft beer, in short, do you? I, th- I think that's why I can really talk about it honestly in a way that a lot of the uh, sort of embedded commentators can't. We're going to bring those kind of insights to the subject of politics today as well. Too um, many hops. <laughs> it's been a quietish week on the domestic front with the House in recess and MPs spread around the globe, among them a group of MPs on the Speaker's Tour in Latin America, uh, who are definitely not on a junket. Uh, Paula Bennett is, I think, going off to sign the Paris Climate Agreement. Peter Dunn is on drugs, and others are looking after their children during the school holidays. The Prime Minister has a group of ministers and uh, people in business in China where he's talking about um, an upgrade or a makeover of the trade deal and having to deal with uh, pesky issues involving the South China Sea and extradition along the way. Meanwhile, here the main story that is still watching the fallout from is the Panama Papers um, and the issue of whether or not New Zealand is a tax haven. How do you think John Key came out of all of that shamozzle, Ben? In in, in the end, well, um, probably because the Labour opposition really kind of focused their attacks wrongly. Um, the Panama Papers, is, <laughs> its relevance to New Zealand is not really a tax issue or a tax haven issue and it's certainly not a New Zealand resident tax issue um, you know I, th- I think no New Zealanders were named in the Panama Papers um, what it's really about is transparency and about shuffling money from countries you know where there is much more rife corruption you know uh, Russia you know uh, Putin sort of um, uh, patronized kind of few um, and and about you know about the use of these kind of trusts um, 
to 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 to, to create opacity in terms of where this money is going overseas um, and 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 that becomes relevant in terms of you know if you're, if you're trying to introduce sanctions or freeze assets of you know what are who are essentially criminals um, that becomes a lot more difficult when you don't actually know who the owners of these trusts are um, because the sort of the nominal owner will stay the same you know some lawyer in you know in Shortland Street or something operating out of a one room office and then the shares in the in that company will sort of change hands from Russia to China to you know <laughs> darkest africa and it's very hard to keep track of that because of the disclosure and so new zealand's role in that in terms of providing what most people agree are not terribly transparent uh, foreign trusts um well, at the outset, when the first when, when when the issue first landed, Michael Woodhouse said it was ridiculous to call New Zealand a tax haven. John Key backed him up, um, and that, in spite of the fact that the Mossack Fonseca leaks described New Zealand as a tax haven, countless websites um, one just needed to Google for a few minutes were promoting New Zealand and its tax haven qualities and then all the tax experts came out and said that yeah New Zealand in this instance operates as a tax haven at the start at least don't you think Annabelle Key and Woodhouse looked on shaky ground they did but the thing is that this is not a new story is it Guyon Espiner did this story on TV3 years and years and years ago 60 minutes so, show, uh, yeah. yeah 60 minutes 3D one of them yeah um so it's it's not a new story yeah it I th- they were on um, shaky ground. However, I don't think that it's seriously hurt key. Um, like Ben said, Labour was so lacklustre in their um, response that I don't think that it's done him any serious damage and it probably you know, won't until Labour can sort of get themselves organised. So it was an opportunity lost for them. It is, it is, there's a political element to this <clears throat> in that for as long as I can remember, uh, New Zealand governments, whether Labour or National, have promoted that New Zealand is the easiest country to do business in the world. Mm-hmm. Now, what that in international sort of measures, that's essentially just a, a kind of stopwatch measurement of how long it takes you to register a company or a trust yeah. online. In New Zealand, you can do it in a couple of hours. Um, and so, so there's there's a political roadblock to actually requiring more information to be given about the kind of true ownership or beneficial interest um, in companies or, or or trusts that are established here, um, because that means suddenly we slide down the rankings, you know, sort of behind Luxembourg and all these other things, because there's sort of you know a couple of days turnaround checking this information. The all it's sort of off brand though, isn't it, with the whole one hundred percent pure New Zealand international flavour that we like to put out there. It does look grubby and I think what Gareth Morgan said on the nation, you know, in the weekend, it's only worth twenty four million dollars. It's yeah. better to tidy it up. It's it's just sort of not worth it. I mean I think it's easy to overstate the reputational stuff. The idea that anyone is really watching New Zealand and assessing its role in this scandal is is, is pretty slim. But all the same, it's incredible that um we're talking about this issue and we immediately start talking about the Labour Party, <laughs> whereas um, <coughs> whereas really this is, surely this is the kind of issue where managed carefully from an opposition standpoint, you say this ties into our broader narrative, which is about John Key being a weather vane, the National Party being incrementalist, not actually holding clear moral ethical positions on anything. And so when, this, so, so when it comes up, they sort of say, they shrug and they go, no, it's all right, you guys are all wrong. And then, a week later, it's changed. It's a U-turn, in effect. Wasn't it a U-turn to appoint John Schuen to do this review? It was a PR U-turn. In practical terms, whether it will be a U-turn, I think, depends on the sort of report that they're expecting back. Um, look, I, th- I think you're right. Um, the, the, other, the other angle that you could take is this is happening and no one knew about it. You know, the, the kind of a sleep at the wheel sort of angle. Mm. Um, but, but instead, um, I think the phrase Andrew Little used over the weekend when asked about his performance was, you know, barking at every car. Mm. Somehow this turned into the, the, a reversion to the old Labour fantasy that John Key is somehow an international financial criminal of some sort mm. and that the Panama Papers were his own personal mm. <laughs> kind of um, digest of wrongdoing. Um, and, and that fails to resonate because it's not true. It also becomes, I think, a little bit kind of thinly spread, that whole barking at every car, you know, part of the point of that 
metaphor is that it's just a, a permanent wall of noise. And so they got stuck into, Labour got stuck into the John Shewan thing and, and said that he had these links to the Bahamas. He'd been on a trip there with Don Brash. And John Shewan gave a very strong riposte to that on Checkpoint with John Campbell. And it seemed in the end to be kind of a, a footnote rather than the main issue. The main issue was always about these reviews. And it, I don't know, they might have made something more of the call for a tax to... to to, to publish a tax return, which is what Andrew Little did. Did they just sort of lose focus, Annabelle? Oh, it's hard to know what they're up to. Like, the thing is that we're not asleep at the wheel. We have known what we've known about this issue for some time and it shows that you know there's a lack of will from national to tidy it up because they like to take care of the super rich you know they could have juxtaposed this issue to for example you know the IRD crackdown on cashies now if it weren't for cashies the working poor in New Zealand a lot of them would probably slip right under the yeah. poverty line so on one hand they're sort of turning a blind eye to this but, you know, cracking down on ordinary bricklayers and concreters and that who are trying to get a few extra bucks in their, in their pocket a week. So I think, you know, Labour, again, a lack of focus and but, an opportunity loss. Yeah, to, to, to read... It's a long bow, but I think, you know, to, it's not as long as the bow they, that, that they did end up drawing. That's right. You know, be, being, there's something about the, the unfolding tragedy of the Labour Party that just keeps drawing people in. You know, we can't leave alone the, the, the sort of horror of their, their kind of undoing. Um, and, and part of it is that they just don't seem to take things seriously. You know, the, the sorts of, Rob Hosking did a great uh, column in the NBR <clears throat> online, I think, discussing how, you know, not, not only was Labour sort of sh- shrill and um, kind of panicky in terms of its attacks on John Shewan, but it was wrong. It, it, show, it showed that none of their senior figures or none of their advisors actually knew how um, GST rating on financial services worked. Um, none of the people, you know, it, it's hard to find people in portfolios in Labour who are really digging in and doing a lot of work. Mm. I know there's been a lot of chopping around and changing of positions and focus over the last, getting on now eight years of opposition, but you don't really get the sense that any of them have kind of become embedded in their portfolios with in the, the way that Tony Ryle was in health. Or, with, with the exception of Calvin Davis, I think it's fair to say. No, look, and he, he's he's really good at performing MP, but, but n- not in an area that's probably probably going to get them a lot of traction in mainstream New Zealand. Mm. Um, apart, you know, he's doing well in corrections and that, that you know, th- it, it's not a choice between highfalutin policy or gutter attacks on the government because if you know your portfolios well and you're actually engaged in what's happening with them, you'll get both. Um, and, and right now Labour is in a position where its attacks look petty because they're usually misguided mm. and they're not offering anything of substance either. And that's a difficult position for them to get out of. They sometimes look a bit hurried too, I think. I mean, I know we talk about the 24-hour news cycle, which is, of course, a nonsense in New Zealand unless you spend your life on Twitter. We don't have 24-hour news. But the the speed, the alacrity with which they seem to want to have a response to everything, it's a bit like people searching again online and then posting on blogs or whatever. Look, I found this news clipping of John Shewan in, in the Bahamas. We got him, we got him, we got him. You kind of think, like, whereas interestingly, by contrast, James Shaw said, I don't want to get into the, we don't want to get into the question of John Shewan. It's not about him. What it is about is about the fact that we have a tax, New Zealand, New Zealand tax expert or, you know, practitioner, accountant, rather than someone from overseas. Mm-hmm. So, and, 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 and that seemed like a pretty sound argument. You don't want to get someone that's embroiled and you want someone from overseas who can cast an independent eye over our systems. I, th- I think that's a good point. It does, you know, they do, they do just seem like a bunch of dilettante bloggers most of the time. They don't, <laughs> they, they don't appear like they have any kind of background, you know, grounding in what they're talking about. And so it is necessarily off the cuff, hurried, mm. once over lightly, um, you know, and in some cases this is excusable. You know, if you see if you see the the Nui hotel build, um, and then you see that you know that the company donated or the, the the owner of the company donated money to the National Party, and then you see Murray McCulley's involved, it's probably worth tugging on that string. But in most other cases, you know, the, you're really speculating wildly about wrongdoing that probably just doesn't exist. What what's to be done? I mean, we had kind of confirmation in a way of. Uh Difficult times, to put it uh, mildly, that the Labour Party are undergoing with a Colmar Brunton 
poll uh, maybe a fortnight ago now, in which they were on, I think, was it 28 that Labour landed on? Mm. And National were on 50. Um, what do you, what do you, what do you, what, what would you, I mean, you've advised politicians before, Ben, what, what would you do for a, if we paid you your, whatever you get paid, $500 an hour or whatever, to, to come in and <laughs> give them a masterclass? I, I don't think, I don't think the preliminary steps are that hard. Um, Labour have made a big deal about beh- uh, uniting the caucus behind Andrew Little. Everything I know about that seems to be correct. Um, I don't think they've got the kind of levels of sort of infighting and undermining that they used to have. No, there's not going to be a coup before the next election. Yeah, now, now they need, now they need to take this, the difficult step of starting to look outside their own party, which is something the Labour Party has had a huge amount of difficulty doing in the last eight years. Um, my pet theory about the left is that the, the sort of utopian kind of outlook they have suggests that if you can just kind of get the settings right and the institutional kind of rules correct, then you know, then sort of perfection follows, whether it's in society, whether it's an electoral outcome. And Labour need to realise that they actually get, need to go out there and engage with the world, mm-hmm. not just fix things in their own backyard. And that comes back to you know, getting in and doing work. Um, in the areas that they're meant to be holding the government to account in. I heard Bill English speaking, you know, about bef- before National took power when he was an opposition spokesman. And he he told a bunch of professionals that, you know, if you, if you get a department's statement of intent, its annual report, um, and, and um, oh, you know, and, and, and look at, you know, the, the questions to the minister, you'll probably know more about what's happening in that department than the minister will. Now, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that might be correct. And Labour doesn't even seem to have done that kind of basic work of kind of getting to grips with with figuring out what being in government would be like for them. Is that the way you see it, Annabelle? Do you do you you talk to different politicians of all stripes in your work? Do you feel as though Labour have the a far away from being ready, or do they yeah. feel do they feel a long way? I think so. I think. I think the problem with Labour is that they reek of desperation and ambition and people can smell it from a mile away. They, they're they not behaving or they don't give the appearance of being a formidable political machine anymore. They, they appear to be so caught up in identity politics now that no one can really identify with them. I think it was... Um, Heather Duplessis Allen, who said they lack authenticity, and you sort of touched on it, Ben, about you know the MPs really digging down into their portfolios, and I think there's a real lack of that, a lack of conviction and cohesion, and I think they really need some sort of circuit breaker. It's the Labour Party who turned 100 in, in, in July, I think. Um, and happy, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Speaking of the Labour Party, one of the their last uh, Prime Minister, Helen Clark, uh, now lives in New York. And um, some of you may have noticed she's recently formally announced that she'll be standing uh, to be the next Secretary General of the United Nations uh, when um, Ban Ki-moon stands down. Um, seems to have been a fairly positive response to that uh, across the parties in New Zealand. Annabelle? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because people have written that, yeah, it has sort of united, um, well, it has support right across the political spectrum. But my Facebook news feed is chock a block with Māori from across um, the political divide ranting and raving about um, the prospect of her getting made um, General Secretary, I think, you know, obviously there's still a lot of resentment over Foreshore and Seabed, where she thumbed her nose at um, the report done by the Special Rapporteur, Stephen Hagen, um, who Ben is a huge fan of. But, you know, in 2007, she refused to resi- uh, sign the UN's Declaration for Indigenous Rights. Um, she, yeah, did, she, she, did, she did eventually, though. No, she no, did a national did. did, did, did national did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, she, you know, backed away from close, uh, closing the gaps when that sort of became ethnically politicised by um, by Winston Peters. So this Maori have long memories when it comes to Helen Clark and her hater and wrecker statements of the early two thousands, and um, she certainly um, hasn't convinced, you know, a large sector of Maori them that she's the right person for the job. That's for sure. 
So those people who are making those complaints, are they also saying this is the wrong person for the job or are they just saying or are they providing a kind of a check to the idea that we're universally behind her? I think it's, yeah, more the hypocrisy that they're calling her out on, that she wants to lead the UN when only, you know, 10 or so years ago she was um, thumbing her nose at that very organisation, so. What do you reckon, Ben? I mean, look, Helen Clark was an extremely talented politician in Absolutely. New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> one, one of these people probably like John Key that everyone sees greater things for. And I, I think Clark really did have a kind of world stage level of ruthlessness that was probably wasted in the New Zealand scene. Um, <laughs> yeah, she, 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 only got a, she only got a couple of outlets for... <laughs> Um, so look, I, I mean, obviously, there's there's no downside for New Zealand. There's only benefits um, for New Zealand um, and Clark. If, if if Clark is successful, um, those benefits are, are probably pretty rhetorical, and you know, can be easily overstated. I think. Um, but you know, once once you get people like Key and Clark, they're you know members of the sort of cosmopolitan class. You know, it really does sort of transcends Labour and National. You know, these these are people who see themselves as world players, um, and 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 see New Zealand politics as somewhere that they've kind of come from, but not really their true home. I think. Like when you've um, made it from the local council, the local body council, into Parliament, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, anyone got any strong views on Irina Bukova, the Bulgarian front runner? Anyone have any strong views on that? Joe, say any views on that? He's got a lot of views, but he hasn't got a microphone because he's, he's, he's on the decks, so he's, he's silenced. Um, there was some reports, I think, um, in the British press about UNESCO and uh, some allegations of some cronyism involved in that, which may do Arena Bukova some uh, harm. Uh, but I think that I think that. Uh, Helen Clark is the favourite, according to William Hill. Not according to British. Kevin Rudd, though, eh? Kevin Rudd. He's poo-pooed her chances. <laughs> is that sour grapes or what's oh, happening Kevin there? Kevin Rudd. Happy to Come on, Kev. He, well, he, he wants to... The, the thinking is that he is hanging on until the permanent five of the of the Security mm-hmm. Council, who are the ones who really make the decision, even yeah. though there's much more of this performance, which is good. People are giving these these sort of this General Assembly hustings, and so... Last week, you could read a very good account on the spin-off by Tim Murphy of Helen Clark's appearance, in which she faced 88 questions. Um, but what Rudd is hoping is that the P5 will not be able to settle on an East European candidate, the thinking being that it's the Eastern, Eastern Europe's turn, having not yet had a Secretary General, and that Kevin, little Kev, is going to wait for that moment, and then he's going to pounce like a frog in a sock, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and suddenly suddenly everyone will rally around Kev and go, you're the you're, you're this this man who can speak fluent Chinese and Time has, a kangaroo down has such <clears throat> such well known charisma will be the guy. <laughs> Sorry, what was the point? <laughs> you reckon Kevin Kevin's Kevin's your man? Is it Adam? No, he's not the, my man. The the the, the, the oh. point is just that wherever you are at any given moment, Kevin Rudd is waiting. <laughs> He is waiting and he's ready to pounce. I feel it like might not be today. It might be two to, two to three years into your term as UN Secretary General. But Kev's out there. For some reason, I feel I feel obliged to mention, given the special rapporteur was noted, that when my son was born, and I was at the time working in a job that involved lots of stuff to do with the United Nations and reading lots of really boring things, I used to sing a song when I changed my son's nappy that went... I'm the special rapporteur de poo from the UN <laughs> Commission for you. And I feel as though that's the sort of, these are the kind of anecdotes that we need to get more of in the politics podcast. Absolutely. Has anyone else got anything to add on that front? I think we should leave it there because how, how do you improve on that? Well, let's talk again uh, briefly about the leadership of the National Party. Um, I talked to Paula Bennett a few weeks back, um, and as part of that, I asked her about her aspirations for the National Party leadership. I'm not ruling it out, but I'm just not going at something that concerns me on a daily basis. Um, Life's full of twists and turns, and I'm kind of 
going on the ride of my life that I never thought I'd be on. Those questions are going to keep coming, though, aren't they? It's, sure. going to, it's a bit of a bore, but they will keep on... I mean, they're good questions to be asked in a way. <laughs> and one way they're flattering, you know, because... Ten years ago, no one would have thought I'd be a minister, let alone thinking that I might be in contention and having to deal with questions like this. So how can I not at some level be flattered that people think I'm doing a good enough job that I might have a future job that's bigger than this? You know, that's, that's got to, if that's what it means, then I'm thrilled, and all that does is drive me to keep doing the best job I can right now. And I know that sounds weedy, but the other thing I would say to you is that... Um, I've seen enough people in both history and in present times that are so damn consumed with their next job that they don't do the one they're in well enough now. And, it's, and, it, and, and, that they be, and they become bonkers. So that's Paula Bennett sounding a little bit Ellen Ginsberg talking about the best political minds of her generation going bonkers. Um, I don't know whether, whether she might be talking about any, any of her cabinet colleagues, Ben. I, I don't think too many of them um, have date planned uh, for when they're going to take over from John Key. Um, <laughs> that, you know, that's that's something far in the future for everyone, I think, in the, uh, in the National Caucus. But Paula Bennett has... I asked her in the interview about her portfolio kind of range that she's got now, which includes social housing, climate, which she didn't want, but now she says she's very excited about associate um finance associate state services or she, 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 is, state she services. is state services yeah. Isn't she? yeah you don't have associate and then and then a couple of other bits and bobs and 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 um quite quite an eclectic range. is that I, I put it to her that that was finishing school for for a future <laughs> prime minister and she quite liked that idea do you think that's what it is or or something else yeah i mean i i think it was there was an obvious and marked shift in Paula Bennett's public presentation um, after th- after the um, the resignation of Judith Collins uh, shortly before the 2014 election uh-huh. uh, from Cabinet and, and when Paula Bennett became the ranking woman in the national government, um, suddenly I think the, the leadership kind of road looked a bit more open to her and you saw, you did see that she, she started to be talked about as a future leader, and um, and you know those 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 kinds of suggestions don't come out of nowhere. You know that's not the hive mind of the press gallery just sort of coming up with things. Um, and so she she did press for um, a wider range of portfolios because she she had done six years of social development. Yeah, she'd done an extremely good job. I mean, she was a national party minister. Um, in charge of social welfare, and I, I can't remember any significant hits that the opposition landed on her during that time. She's mm. an extremely skillful politician. Mm. She, in fact, on her website, if I recall correctly, it actually says um, it, six years as in social development, the longest anyone has ever served in their role. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it is, which is kind of telling, isn't it? It is a, a bit of a hospital pass of a, of a portfolio in a way. The, yeah, that's right. But and but she and Tony Rail and Health yeah. um, managed to actually, you know, make weaknesses strengths, which is you know the real trick to politics. And about Paul, Paula Bennett, National Party leader, Prime Minister, does it sound plausible to you? It'd be interesting. She'd be that if she were to become the first Maori Prime Minister, wouldn't it? But are we yeah. ready for a Prime Minister who sounds like Lynn of Tower? Well, arguably, John Key isn't exactly. You know, uh, received pronunciation. She's used her backstory to great effect, I think. Like you said, she she's a pretty smart operator. She also came out recently, owns a bunch of houses in Auckland, and I think that was in the pecuniary. West she Auckland? is desperately trying to get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the 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 plight of the multi homeowner who just can't seem to offload them fast enough. Who else is it? Who else is sort of in the mix? Do you reckon, Ben? I mean, who now is it out there? Who's on the radar? I, th- I, th- I think the people who are on the radar or who are trying to get themselves on the radar, um, and those are not necessarily the two two of the same groups. Um, Stephen Joyce, obviously. He's been touted as a successor to Key. Um, Simon Bridges, yeah. um, in terms of the younger guys. Uh, Judith Collins, uh, quite clearly. Um, Paula Bennett would be in that group. Um you know, never count Bill English out. Mm. Um, he's he's actually the obvious choice. Um, although, 
although he's he's retired his electorate seat and I, I think the chances of him wanting the big job again you know for anything more than sort of a, a short kind of care caretaker, 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 caretaker was pretty slim yes. yeah. she would have of the of that bunch she'd be the one that would you know she has the common touch doesn't she as opposed to the other three I think um that's something that Simon Bridges is lacking I think Judith Collins is seen as quite aggressive and unapproachable Joyce um obviously you know not not so much the the the, the issue the issue of course is um, is not convincing the public immediately but convincing your colleagues yes um, in in the lead up to and uh, in the event of a transition um, I don't think anyone will be looking for some kind of primary style bloodbath um, which has kind of sort of which you know basically destroyed the act party as a kind of going political concern in the mid 2000s um, and arguably hasn't done wonders for Labour either. Uh, no, no, exactly. That's probably us. Should we sing a Waiata? Uh, yep. That, what, one, that one about the poo? Yeah. What did, you, well, what did they sing at, when when, um, when when Helen Clark announced her bid? They sang oh, Tutti Tutti Mai. No, it was Tutti Tutti Mai. Oh, Tutti Mai, that's right. So Which again one. really rankled a because, lot of Māori because it's about unity. Yeah. And um, she is not, not seen as a, a person who has... Um, encourage unity. Tato, Tato Air, that's gone by lunchtime. Thank you very much to Annabelle Lee and Ben Thomas and Jose Barbosa on the decks. Uh, we will return with another edition before you know it. Talo for Lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. The Spinoff Podcast Network.